Yeah, if you're looking at these videos, you might find that some of them have some problems with the sound, okay? That's, uh, we are trying to fix it, so hopefully it will, uh, will be okay in due time. Yes, I promised you an exercise. Uh, that's what you learn from, isn't it? Doing exercises, okay? So uh, let's go up on level here and go to the exercise folder. Uh, there we start with number one, of course, and uh, you see there are three files here. The first one is the exercise text, exercise underscore one dot pdf, and then there is a lecture note in induction proofs. And then there is an Excel file. Okay, so let's uh, start with the first one and see what it contains. Uh, it says here that this first exercise is related to induction proofs and regression analysis. We have only learned about one of these topics. I have not learned anything about induction proofs, and I hope you don't know what it is. The idea is that you should read the second text, which is about induction proofs. Um, let's have a look at it. Uh, it's a, a lady named Elizabeth Stapple who wrote this text at some point, and I did some slight changes on it. And it kind of introduces this concept of induction proofs. The idea is to it's kind of a general proof technique in mathematics, which is very convenient to use in many situations. So, so the idea here is that, that I just want to test whether you're able to kind of capture the content and perform this induction proof as in the description here, okay? So um, at least you should try, okay? This is pure math, so to speak. It's okay. That was not the right document, maybe it's here, yeah. Then we move to the regression part, uh, or the forecasting part. It's, uh, it may not necessarily be such that you need to or should use regression analysis here, okay? Or actually you may, perhaps because it's specified in the exercise, I think, okay? So the, the idea here is that we have some observations, of course, in this case it's uh, Nintendo GameCube monthly United States sales in 2002 in the figure here. Do you know what uh, Nintendo GameCube was? You, you have heard about Nintendo, haven't you? Yeah, what is Nintendo? Since video games. Uh, Maria says that Nintendo produced video games. Uh, yeah, that's the correct. Brand, the brand, uh, they produce two, uh, today there are mainly two things they produce, video games, and yeah, video hardware, okay? And in Nintendo GameCube was uh, a certain hardware introduced in early 2000, which kind of is phased out now, by the way. The, the hardware that came after was named Wii, and the one which is now is named? Xbox. No, not Xbox, that is produced by Microsoft. It's called Wii U. Yeah. You heard about this. Yeah, there are three main manufacturers of these consoles. It's Microsoft, they have the Xbox. And then there's a Japanese producer called Sony. What do they produce? What kind of console do they produce? You don't know. Have you heard about PlayStation? PlayStation. Have you heard about PlayStation? Yes. Yeah, there's one, two, three, and upcoming four. Do you know when it comes? You're not interested in, in computer games, none of you. And you're students in event management. <laughs> huh. ah, okay, I'm surprised. Video games is the future of events, isn't it? Yeah. To some extent, you should pay some interest in this mar market. It's uh, an important one when it comes to the future, I think. Any, in any way, that's not the point here. This was just a background story about what kind of data we see. So you see here the on the data, don't you? As I told you, that in this case you should expect higher sales around Christmas, and we, we can see that here, can't we? It starts out here, and uh, oh actually it was not so much in December of one. Maybe that's the launch point. But you see, when you come to December of two, something happens here. Okay, so maybe it was introduced here, perhaps. Maybe this is the first sales month. In that case, it's a bit of a different story. So, uh, and then there is something, then you should actually be here, uh, use a simple regression model, so you sh you are, you're forced to do that here. 
and you should compare the kind of predictions you get when you kind of fit this regression line or whatever you do into here, or maybe you should do use non-linear regression, I don't know, you can try yourself, okay? And uh, finally, do you have any suggestions for improvement of your model? So, okay, so you're forced, I tell you what to do and then you're free to do what you like to see if you can come up with a better forecasting model than a, a regression model here. And you need some data to do this and the data is available here, okay? Let's, this is an Excel file and it contains uh, actually for three consoles, as you can see, you have the PlayStation 2 here, and the Xbox, and the GameCube. So, uh, none of these are sold these days, but uh, these are old. But you see, if you look at the data, you see that it contains more than these observations. You have observations for 2003, 2004, 2005, and it stops there. Okay, so there is more than so the idea then here perhaps is to kind of produce a forecasting model based on the first year and try to compare that with what actually happened in 2005 and 2006 and so on. Of course you are not allowed to use that information in building your model, okay? If you do that then you kind of cheat, okay? Because you, the idea with the forecasting model is of course to, to use the data which is available now. And basically what we think here is that we stand here, okay? This uh, is our point of departure for modeling. So you build a model based on these data and then you kind of push it forward to see how it behaves. And it's probably not surprising that if you put a linear regression in here on this data, it looks like this, it, you get a line like this, won't you? And if you use that for forecasting purposes, it will grow into heaven. So that is probably not a good idea, okay? Especially when you actually, you can see that it doesn't grow into heaven it maybe behaves. So you should plot the data, have a look at them and try to come up with something. Okay, any question to your task? Is one week enough? Yeah, we don't have time for more, okay? So uh, I will run through this in a week, okay? Monday, upcoming. Then you'll get the solution text and I will run through it. As you probably ob have observed, there are no solutions in the frontier part here, I think. I think I removed them, didn't I? Let's see. <coughs> yeah, it's empty, as it should be. Okay. So the idea is, of course, that you should know what to do when you do it. That's the, the point here, is you should think a little bit yourself and try to come up with something. Here. We have learned some methods, you have to pick one or several and try to do something reasonable. In any case, we know now that using these forecasting models you, you eventually end up with will, will prove wrong anyway, because uh, uh, the Wii came. It came in 2006, okay, the year after this. So then suddenly no GameCubes were sold anyway. So <laughs> so it, but, uh, but that's not the point, of course. This is information which is known by the manufacturers, so they will not run into that trap to believe that they will sell a lot of GameCubes when they launch the Wii. Okay, that seems like an obvious thing. Okay. Questions, comments, suggestions? You're silent, so you're happy then. Okay. Now, as I said, in the first part of the course, we learn classical logistics. Okay, so what we talk about now is perhaps not obviously relevant for events, even though it might be anyway. Okay. So we start kind of at the top in the logistics pyramid. We kind of start up with the most strategic models we have, meaning that we kind of have a reasonable time horizon. So we may plan for a year maybe a couple of years, but not 30 years, okay? That's not the thing. So this aggregate planning concept, this, th this term aggregate re uh, re uh, refers to the fact that we, we kind of do relatively strategic decisions. So we don't kind of do very operational, okay? We have at one side operational decisions, meaning what we do from day to day, from hour to hour, from minute to minute, and then we have kind of more strategic decisions 
the kind of things we do once a year, twice a year, something like that. If you think th about the event side, if you think about the theater, uh, what kind of decisions does the theater make? Well, they have to decide on what place to play, don't they? If you have a kind of running theater, then uh, you have to make a decision on what place to put up the stage. And for the big uh, professional theaters, this is not a single play, okay? They can play. Is somebody wanting to come in or? Yeah, it seems so. Did they, did they leave? Uh, is that? Well, no, they lured the boy. Oh, yeah. So you have to decide on what to play on your theater, okay? And but the next step you have to decide on who should play, shouldn't you? The actors. That will have to be settled. And then you have to based on that, you when you have that information, then you can start doing some more operational planning, okay? What drinks to serve in the bar, how many seats to put at each play and so on. Okay? So these kind of more strategic ones kind of put the frame framework on on the on, on, on other decisions. Uh, it's not such that you cannot make all decisions simultaneously. At least maybe that's what you should have done in principle. But uh, from a practical point of view, that could be complicated. It could be difficult, almost impossible. So you kind of have to make some kind of decomposition here where you kind of make some decisions and let those decisions kind of make the framework for other decisions. And in aggregate planning, what we focus on then is kind of rough decisions related to how much to produce of a product, how to handle inventory and work force. Okay. So if you kind of set up a company producing a certain product, you need to make those decisions, don't you? You need to, to know how many people to hire, uh, which types of people to hire, what kind of qualifications they should have and so on. But the model we will look at uh, as we move on is a bit more easy than that. Okay? We just look at single workers. They kind of produce the same, they have the same productivity as we tend to call it. So this is a very simplified aggregate planning model. Maybe you don't think so, but if you think about reality, it is. Okay? So it's try kind of trying to give you some impression on how these can be done. Okay, let me take out these numbers and uh, move on. <coughs> Maybe you should do it nicely. It's not always so easy to see on these boards with a lot of chalk on them. So we might try to clear it really good here. Now, in order to make these decisions on how much to produce and how much to store, if we want to use that option, and how many people to hire or fire or keep or so on, we, we obviously need to know how much the customers would like to buy. So these demand forecasts are essential here, okay? So we need demand forecasts. as input. And uh, to some extent we have learned how to find those, okay? We spend some time on discussing that. <coughs> now, in reality, as we also have discussed, we cannot perhaps always be very certain on our forecasts. So there may be, be certain uncertainty related to the forecast we produce and the actual demand which is revealed as time goes by. So in practice, when you do this, you need to kind of take that uncertainty into account and you should take it into account. However, in the lecture, at least so far, we do not take that uncertainty into account. So we assume now that we hit perfectly with our predictions. Okay? 
So another assumption here is that ft equals dt for all future t's. Okay? That may seem like a very great simplification. Obviously it is. However, handling uncertainty is not necessarily easy. We will look into a few models later in the course which are especially relevant for event uh, the event situation, but so at, at this moment we kind of leave that out. Okay, so this assumption is important here. In the optimization modeling language, we then tend to see that we look at deterministic optimization. So far, I haven't told you that we should kind of end up in an optimization setting here, but of course that's the point. The idea with almost everything we do in log logistics is to try to aim for efficiency. And efficiency is very often a cost optimization, typically minimize, minimization. And so this is the kind of setting here as well, okay? If we hire too much people, then we produce products which there are no buyers for. If we hire too little, then we're not able to cover our demand. So we need to balance here, okay? And if there's a kind of variation in our future demand pattern, then we must, we must kind of lay some kind of puzzle here, won't we? We have to kind of either hire a lot of people early, making them produce to before the kind of jump comes, so we can kind of put up in storage to, to, to capture the, the market. Or alternatively, we've got to have a dynamic type of policy where we kind of hire and fire a lot to kind of keep track on the actual predicted demand. And this is the kind of mother of all logistic planning, basically, these kind of problems. Uh, they, they kind of show up in most situations, from the most strategic to the most operational. And we will see numerous examples of them during this course. So, so this is kind of an important point now. Okay. <coughs> But before we move into the optimization, well the alternative here, if we kind of would take this uncertainty into account, is referred to as stochastic op uh, optimization. And the difference is then, of course, then we don't assume this. Then we kind of put some probability mechanisms on, or re on, on the relation of our forecasts and, and, uh, and the actual demand. And we kind of utilize that random mechanism in the actual optimization. It's kind of a tricky stuff, okay, but we will move slightly into it. Not so much, I think. Okay, but before we kind of move into the optimization scene here, we will uh, look at what kind of costs we would expect in a situation like this. So uh, the next topic is uh, aggregate planning costs. That's perhaps relatively obvious. If we want to minimize costs, we need to have some knowledge about what costs are relevant in this situation. The textbook starts discussing various costs elements. The first one they look at is smoothing costs. And uh, you should perhaps not look at this term smoothing in the same way as you did in exponential smoothing. This is a kind of different smoothing. Okay. Um, Uh, these smoothing costs are the type of costs I briefly discussed previously. Okay, when you now, if you hire more people, then you produce more. Okay, if you fire people, you produce less. So you can kind of smooth or kind of adapt to your demand by kind of manipulating your staff. In the event sense, this is this is kind of common, isn't it? If you set up an event, you kind of make forecasts for how much audience you get, and based on that forecast, you will try to discuss how many people do I need, how many volunteers do I need, how many professionals do I need, and so on. It may even be that there is a dynamic plan here within the event. So certain days you have more people than other days. If you look at the local jazz festival, you would expect that you have more volunteers in the weekend than on the weekdays, perhaps, because the demand is higher in the weekend. And you have to make this plan. You have to decide on how many people, which types, 
you want to employ, what payment they should get, and so on. Okay. So these kind of decisions will have to be made. So these smoothing costs is kind of related to how you can operate your manpower. So you can hire a little bit to kind of increase production, fire a little bit to decrease production. You can use kind of your manpower to smooth or adapt to your demand, your predicted demand structure. Now we have to say something about how these costs work. Okay. So and and the normal, the most simple way of doing this is to assume so-called linear costs. And by linear costs here, we very often actually assume proportional costs, which are kind of even stronger than linear costs. So if HT is a variable, is the number of people we hire in a certain time period. Let's assume we have this variable, okay? And if there is a cost associated, associated with, with this hiring process, maybe we'll have to make some interviews and so on, okay, to, to get the right people, then we normally assume that it's linear and proportional. So we have some kind of cost related to this HT. CT times HT would then compromise our total hiring costs, if you like, in this simple example. So the assumption of linearity and proportionality here means that kind of we, we can kind of compute our cost by using a simple constant multiplied with the cost. Of course, in practice, it's not necessarily true that it is like this, is it? Because I would expect that there may be some kind of scale benefits in hiring people. So it may not be twice as cost twice as high cost to hire 20 as 10. Okay, you may kind of use some kind of internal recruiting stuff which kind of makes it cheaper if the number increase. So it could be a pattern which maybe goes something like this instead in reality. But to make it not too tr tricky, we very often make it like this, which kind of is basically what we mean by this assumption here. And this we kind of run through all we do at this model here. So we basically assume that all costs are linear, meaning that we can compute them by just multiplying the actual variable with a certain cost factor. A cost per unit, a cost per person, cost per hour, whatever. Again, simplification. Okay, so we, we kind of start by doing a lot of simplifications related to how we kind of would expect the world to be. Okay, now let's just take these out and keep on with our costs here. The second cost component, which is, which is briefly discussed in the textbook, is inventory costs. Yeah, I, I assume you have a certain knowledge about inventory, okay? You, you the normal definition on inventory when, it, when we think about logistics is uh, production units which are not yet sold but finished produced. Okay? And you, gotta, you kind of keep them either because you're not able to sell them now or because you know that you will get a lot of demand later on. Okay? That is typically the, the concept of inventory. Uh, there is a lot of things related to inventory. Certain products cannot be stored. Most events cannot be stored, can't they? You, you, cannot, uh, you cannot hire Rolling Stones to play on the 1st of January and say you, you keep them. We just wait until 6th of May and then we start. The of course you can do it, but uh, you don't have them accessible each day after that. Okay? You can make a new arrangement for another concert, but uh, normally you cannot store events. So the storage part is perhaps not what is most relevant on the event side itself. On the other hand, there's a lot of resources you use in planning and executing your event that need storing. Okay. Food, beverages, and so on. Okay. Maybe cars, whatever. It's, there's a lot of resources needed which may be bought and stored before the event or both as you move along. And that trade-off will have to be handled in any case. So it's, you should not kind of get the feeling that in the event side there is no need for inventory. That need is there. But perhaps not on the event, the main product itself. 
as opposed to classical manufacturing, they were actually storing the actual product is important. In those cases, it can be stored. But even in, in that cases, you have uh, certain products which may change value under storage, okay. either due to the fact that they have certain characteristics themselves or because the market evaluates them differently as time moves on. Of course, if I had stored now 100,000 objects of Nintendo GameCube at my home, I could probably sell some of them, but uh, not so many. Okay, So the value would have changed a lot. And of course, there are certain products which uh, cannot be stored for a long time because they are destroyed as time moves on. Most food, for instance. Of course, you can freeze it, but it still changes quality and so on. Okay, So there, there are various options related to storing objects that you kind of need to, to take care of. Uh, the fact that storing thing costs is kind of obvious in the sense that you have to have space, you may have to have trucks, you know, uh, what you call it, shelves and so on, to put things on, houses. That is one part of inventory cost. Uh, normally that part is not assumed to be very important. It is not assumed to be a very significant part of inventory cost. Normally we expect that the major part of inventory cost is related to the value of the stored materials. Now let me take an example. Suppose I buy a thousand kilograms or a ton of gold. Okay, do you know the price of gold? Oh, it's kind of high, isn't it? So a ton of gold is perhaps several hundred million Norwegian crowns or something. Okay, I buy this and I store it at my house. Do I, do I, is, is gold kind of like food, does it? No. no. Can I, should I expect that the value goes down? No, no, it could go up as well. So that is not my loss. What kind of loss do you think I'm thinking about here? Or if I instead of buying this gold for 100 Norwegian million crowns, had put the money in the bank instead, what would happen then? after a year. I could take out the money, couldn't I, with a certain interest. That interest I would not get on my gold unless the gold price increased more than uh, the general fa financial markets. Okay. Gold is perhaps a bad example. If I buy cars and put them at home, storing them, of course I can sell them later on, but they will obviously not be as much value than I have obviously have lost the possibility of investing this money that I alternatively could have invested in something else that could produce direct return. So the normal main cost in inventory is kind of the lack, uh, the lack of, of possibly in reinvesting this in some markets that produce uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, return. Okay, so that that is the main part of inventory costs. So if you kind of want to put numbers on it, you you look at the value of the product and you normally take a certain percentage of that. Suppose you're able to, 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 uh, to get uh, interest on uh, invested capital of 5%, then of course you lose these 5% five, five by kind of keeping your, your products in inventory because they do not produce that, that, uh, that interest or that. Uh. So uh, in that sense, uh, inventory costs may be fairly high. Okay, so it's typically kind of reasonable share of the value of the product. The more expensive product you, you produce, of course, the more inventory costs you get then, in that sense. But of course, these actual handling costs, as we tend to call them, by these storage rooms, by the, the guys uh, who work at the inventory and, and the trucks and everything, that, that is of course also part of the cost. But typically it's, it's relatively small. Okay, three. Uh, there's something called shortage costs. If we make this assumption, then we no never have to have shortage costs, don't we? Then we can kind of avoid that because then we can plan in such a way that we always produce enough to cover our forecasts who are equal to the actual demand. But in the real world, uh, as I said, we are not able to predict our, our, our demand perfectly. So we would expect that in some cases there will be more demand than we expect. 
other cases less demand than we expect. The shortage, a shortage cost, it kind of emerges in the situation where demand is higher than we expect. Okay? There are more customers out there who are interested in buying our product, but we don't have it available. To some extent, we could kind of reduce our shortage cost by manipulating the price, can't we? If there is a large queue outside, we kind of increase the price to kind of so much that the latest customer kind of gets out of the queue. In that case, you have to some extent eliminated it. On the other hand, in certain cases, you don't have that option available. That is related to the market you work in, isn't it? If you are a monopolist, that is discussed in the microeconomics course, then you can do this kind of stuff. But if you are in a kind of more competitive environment, uh, environment then it may be difficult. So you should expect these shortage costs to kind of come up from time to time. Uh, in events, they are kind of typical, aren't they? If you, if you run a festival, suddenly certain artists get very popular during the festival. Of course, there's a lot of people who would like to, to see those artists. And if you don't have enough seats, then there is an obvious shortage cost. Of course, you can, again, kind of smoothen it by sh uh, getting these people to go on other concerts, but maybe they don't want to do that. Okay, so, uh, so you see, these, these shortage concepts may be very important. So you'd always try to fit fit your forecast to demand. That's the easiest way of solving it, that kind of problem. When it comes to estimating shortage costs, that's very difficult to, to kind of put numbers. How much does it really cost us? Because this is related to the market. And you, you don't have full information uh, of people's inside heads, meaning that you really need to know how much they would be willing to pay if there were tickets available. That's kind of what defines this shortage cost. And this information is typically not there. You have some indications, but you, that's what you have, some indications. So it's not necessarily easy to kind of put numbers to, or estimate, at, as we say, these costs. But they are there. There are, of course, other options in classical manufacturing. You could use something called backlogging. You know what that is? That is an alternative to using the price mechanism. And it can perhaps still only work in a monopolistic setting. Backlogging means that you say to the customer, OK, I don't have your product today, but if you come back next week, I'll give it to you. Okay, That's backlogging. Yeah. Straightforward. Of course, hard to do in an event setting. Okay, If Rolling Stones is not here next week, then you can't use that strategy at all. On the other hand, on the, the, the kind of manufacturing market, this is an, an obvious option. Of course, you still risk to lose something, don't you? Because customers maybe they don't like this, they go to the competitor to buy instead. So uh, you're not guaranteed to avoid these shortage costs, but uh, you may smoothen them somewhat, okay? make them less uh, dangerous for you if you open up for this. But of course, a successful backloading strategy means that you're able to do it. Okay? So if I say to a customer that I don't have these uh, computer game today, but if you come back on Monday, I'll gi give it to you. But uh, then if the customer comes back and it's not there, of course, then you have lost a lot. Okay, So it needs to be a kind of secure strategy. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm fairly certain that most of you have been in practical situations that resembles this. Okay? You, have been, you have been told that you must come back at a later point to either pick up your good or to, to, to receive it. And, uh, and we all know how annoying these situations are, don't we? We don't like it. If we finally have made up a decision on spending a fair amount of money on some product, we would like it to be there. Ex especially if we expect it to be there, then we can get kind of annoyed. So again, this is very related to what market conditions we operate in. A monopoly is one thing, a perfectly competitive market is something quite different. And of course, it's much easier to use all these other kind of smoothing strategies here if you are in a mon monopolistic market than if you are in a competitive market. That is the nice thing about events. You are to some extent in a, uh, in a monopoli monopolistic market. Okay, So all these guys who come to Molde under the Jazz Festival to, to listen to jazz, they, they will probably be here the whole week. At least if they order a book the hotel for the whole week, they will probably be here. So you can kind of, if you don't have tickets for that concert, you can try to, to, pers to, to persuade them to go to these other concerts. And in many cases, that is a successful strategy. But it may not be that they come back as easily as they would if they kind of got what they wanted. So it's kind of a, a mix, a mix of, uh, of, of problems here. 
The fourth cost is referred to as the regular time cost. The students very often get confused by this one and this one. I talked about hiring and firing here, okay? And what I mean then is not the actual salary that people get, but the costs that I, as the hirer or firer, take when doing that process. Typically it could be interviews or using recruiting agencies and that kind of thing. Here is the actual cost, okay? This is the cost including salary, machinery, everything which is needing overtime and so on to kind of get people to do the job. So this is uh, salary. It could be raw materials. We may need that from time to time in manufacturing. It could be uh, it could be different types of technology. We need some machines. So these are kind of the, the normal costs involved in production. Okay, you have to 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 add this. You have to buy machines, you have to get raw materials, and you have to get people who get to need payment to kind of get the transformation which production is to work. Okay. Now we're dis discussing the introduction here, just to tell you where we are. In so in chapter three, chapter three in the textbook, <coughs> aggregate planning is the title here. I tend to use aggregate production planning to kind of be a bit more specific. Uh, in some cases, we kind of uh, do not include overtime costs in this regular time due to the concept regular then it's irregular time okay that's the other alternative so uh, let's uh, keep on our list of various costs so five would be overtime and subcontracting costs I assume you all know what overtime costs are, they're kind of the added cost you have to pay to get people to work outside their regular working hours. And most people have a working contract, at least in Norway, where you kind of have a certain standard salary per hour for, for your work, which is kind of negotiated as, as, as your work contract, and normally also have some words about what will happen if your employer wants you to work more than this. In that case, you normally will get higher salary per hour. This extra part is kind of linked to these overtime costs. Uh, subcontracting costs could emerge in situations where you choose not to produce everything you need yourself. You may buy product from other producers instead of producing yourself. That is a fairly common strategy to, to use in many cases. It co of course if you have a very tight uh, schedule for produ production. It may be extremely expensive for you to kind of expand the possibilities. It could be easier to, to hire somebody else's factory to produce the same material. So uh, these two components kind of uh, come in addition. One is related to your staff. The other is related to using other people's staff. Both kind of work in the same manner, don't they? That's why they're kind of put together. It's a, it's a possibility to increase uh, your production more than in the regular situation, either by using your own people more or using other people's uh, abilities to produce more. Finally, uh, a somewhat weird concept, often referred to as idle time costs. often assumed non-existent or equal to zero if you like. Uh, idle time costs is related to situations where it actually costs you something if your workers, so to speak, do nothing. 
think about, uh, I think the best example is football players, okay? If you, you have uh, hired a lot of football players to play football for you, you would expect that they should keep practicing and playing games, okay? I don't know how uh, updated you are on the local team, Molde Football Club, but they have, uh, they kind of regained Vegard for and from Southampton this year, didn't they? And if you have studied Molde carefully, before and after this, you will have observed that Vegard Foden is kind of perhaps not performing as good as he did before he left to Southampton. Of course, that could be due to the fact that he was kind of, uh, maybe he was at least not playing any games there, okay? And that may have affected his ability as a football player. That is what we would expect idle cost to be, okay? The idle or the non-activity has kind of inner costs that kind of come as the fact that you actually do nothing. In a work environment, it could be in a sense that if your workers are spending too much idle time, they get lazy or they kind of forget how to do things and you have to, to relearn them and so on. That, that will, will of course produce added costs. But in most cases, we, we tend to overlook these cost uh, components. Okay, time is running? No. Yeah, it is. We take a break. If you have any questions, you can think about those in the break, okay?